the latest, greatest, ever more spectacular Woolworth Christmas Show. EMI, Super Chrome, tapes that come in threes. Tell a tale, tape and book, help the child to read. Five pack Sony tapes, the price is sure to please. If there was one shop that I could consider to be iconic in the UK, it's Woolworths. It sounds weird to say, really, given how their stores were essentially sort of mini supermarkets. Where else could you go to buy clothes horses, uh, toasters, pick and mix sweets, a PS3, and a baby grow in the same place? Well, nowhere but Woolworths. But let's go back to the beginning, shall we? The year is 1890. A Pennsylvanian man called Frank Woolworth was already running successful businesses under his name and travelled to England to pick up china and glassware to sell back in America. While he was there, he had a realisation that he would document in his diary. I believe that a good penny and sixpence store, rung by a live Yankee, would be a sensation here. During his buying trip, he met a young clerk who was recommended by his hero, John Wanamaker. The clerk, whose name was William Stevenson, was invited to meet Woolworth in London, and was offered a job as the director of a new company that Mr. Woolworth was setting up. He accepted. Woolworth went back to America and offered his American store managers the positions in the UK, but this focus on the British market wasn't without its critics. VP and General Manager Carson C. Peck was unsure as to the motives behind Woolworth setting up in Britain. He rejected the idea that the store manager should be relocated across the pond, and he even directly questioned whether or not this was down to the pre-existing American branches just not doing as well as expected. He was so adamantly against it, he would try to dissuade people who volunteered to move. He was quoted as saying this, To me, it seems that these return sheets are in danger of being misunderstood, and that it is a good deal like asking a boy to volunteer to go into a bear's den when he does not know whether he is to eat a nicely cooked luscious bear's steak, or be eaten by a great big black bear. <laughs> this is like the 19th century version of... What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Bro, I'm out, man. I'm stripping. Regardless of Peck's constant naysaying, Woolworth's vision for a UK branch of his business manifested on November 5th, 1909. The chosen city to open in was Liverpool, as it was the dock that Woolworth entered the UK through for the first time. I'll spare you my attempt at the Liverpudlian accent. A full-on circus and firework display was used to celebrate the opening, as well as a live orchestra. However, despite the massive celebration, customers weren't allowed to actually buy anything on the launch day. Back then, American trading tradition stated that customers could only view items on opening day, and would have to come back the next day if they wanted to actually purchase anything. <laughs> And you thought pre-ordering a game was obnoxious. However, it turned out that, for most people, it was worth the wait. Due to the cheap pricing, anywhere between threepence and sixpence, the accessibility of local and foreign goods led to it almost entirely cleared out on the first day of trading. People went mad for Woolworths, or as it was called at the time, Woolworth & Co. By 1918, after the war, Woolworth & Co. had expanded to 40 stores across Great Britain and Ireland. Five years later, that number would more than triple to 130, and the clerk from before, William Stevenson, became managing director. Stevenson's vision of Woolworth & Co., now renamed simply Woolworths, was a more widely available store, and this is clearly reflected in the expansion that was seen after he became managing director. In just over a decade, Woolworths had opened its 600th store. That's insane. That's like four times the growth that you had. In five years, you tripled, and in ten years, you, you, you quadrupled. But there was a moment in history on the horizon which would halt this rapid expansion and change the face of the world forever. The Second World War changed things, and Stevenson's vision was no exception. But somehow, after the war, the expansion continued, 
and the 1,000th branch of Woolworths was opened on May 22nd, 1958. Further expansions would include hypermarket versions of the stores, mini versions of the of the bigger stores. Which, fun fact by the way, right? <laughs> I found this out during my research. They're now all owned by Asda. They're probably like those, those mini Asda stores you see around, like Asda Express or like a, a, Asda. You know the ones I mean. Things were going well for the American business, but the 60s brought two crucial changes for Woolworths. A fire in the Leeds flagship store and the death of Stevenson. Some time passes, and in 1982, Woolworths, as a British business, was acquired by a group called Paternoster Stores Limited. Awkwardly, Paternoster Stores didn't last, and the assets were all formed into the Woolworths Group PLC. With this merger, however, came new directions for the business. This was highlighted in October 1984, when all branches of Woolworths in the Republic of Ireland were closed. And while there were talks to reintroduce Woolworths to the Irish in 1996, the stores would remain closed forever. In 1987, the aforementioned Leeds building of Woolworths was shut down, as focus in Leeds was shifted to the significantly smaller branch in the Marion Shopping Centre. Uh, for those wondering, the five-storey Woolworths building uh, was indeed changed and is currently a house of Fraser. With all this said, the biggest blunder, in my opinion, was the building of these large format, supermarket sized Woolworth stores. They were called Big W's. This format failed to hold interest and was abandoned in 2004, and Woolworths was beginning to feel the struggle of the market changes. And as if that weren't enough, a similar brand of stores were set to directly compete. Wilkinson. Now we get to the Woolworths that I remember, right? No, not least for the awesome advertising campaigns, but we will, we'll get to those in a bit. In 2006, the store adopted an approach inspired by Argos, with a click-and-collect in-store collection service, which even came with a catalogue for browsing called The Big Red Book. Yeah, they weren't lying. These things were ma- But the biggest things Woolworths were known for at this point were the Pick and Mix Sweets and the Worth It brand. Pick and Mix was great, right? You grab a cup, you help yourself to whatever sweets you wanted, and you pay based on the size and weight of the cup. These do actually still exist, but I always associate them with Woolworths. We'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> the Worth It brand was the Woolworths' own brand stuff, advertised by Woolly and Worth, a sheep and sheepdog respectively. Fun fact, these guys are also responsible for Scratch and Sniff from the, from the previous video. It's the LJ Cinematic Universe. They'd often interact with celebrities to sell, like, toasters and five-pound bottles of champagne. No, seriously, this was... <laughs> when you want to celebrate, but in the most cost-effective way possible. This helped to reinvigorate interest in the brand, but... The writing was sadly still on the wall for Woolworths. Anyway, let's have a look at some of those adverts. Sure are. Hang on. You're naked. <gasps> Woolly, run down to Woolworths and get us some jeans and t-shirts from the new Worth It value range. What's <laughs> up? Hey, Jackie. Wax off. Wax off. I wasn't in that one. Dinner's nearly ready. Something hot and steamy. Who is going to be cleaning your toilet, Donald Trump? <laughs> G'day. In 2008, the founder of Iceland, the shop, not the country, Malcolm Walker, offered to buy all of Woolworth's stores. Over 800 stores for £50 million. Its annual sales are three billion pounds. It has 815 stores in high streets all over the UK, and it employs 30,000 people. And here's another big number, its debt of 385 million pounds. While this sounds like a deal you'd be mad to reject at this point, 
it didn't include Woolworths debts or subsidiaries like Entertainment UK. Uh, other famous businessmen like uh, Alan Sugar and Theo Pafitas would even show interest in the brand, with Sugar in particular even increasing his pre-existing stake in Woolworths to 4%. You're fired. The loans were piling up. The debts were never ending. And the bubble burst on November 26, 2008. As trading on the stock market was suspended for Woolworths, and the company stated that it would try to stay open for the Christmas period, but that the future was not long for the company. And indeed, Woolworths initiated a closing down sale in early December, which would last until the final surviving store's closures on January 6th, 2009. In the countdown to the final closure, every single thing was for sale, including the staff lockers. Nobody at Woolies in Northenden wanted to talk on camera, but one worker who loses their job today had tears in their eyes when they told me they'd worked there for 26 years. It'll be interesting to see what replaces it. <laughs> but I guess so, yeah. I mean, it's been there as long as I can remember. Because my sister worked, at, my sister worked, at, worked in there a long, long time ago. Yeah, the old canty was there a long time ago. The canteen's gone. It's not the same all staff is going. It's a shame it's going. I'm going to miss it. But wait, there's a twist! The Woolworths brand and domain name was bought by a group called the Shop Direct Group, which are now known as Very. And Woolworths UK relaunched as an online retail store on June 26, 2009. While it carried the same name, it was not in any way related to the original Woolworths company. It was discontinued in 2015, and for now, the Woolworths domain name just redirects to very.co.uk. Honestly, Woolworths was at its best moments before it died. And yeah, I'm obviously biased as I was nowhere near existence for any prior points. Woolly and Worth are still pretty iconic when it comes to British advertisements, and I still have surprisingly fond memories of Woolworths. Be it begging my mum for a pick and mix, or playing Super Mario Sunshine on a GameCube kiosk at my local branch. Although, of course, my mum would never let me buy pick and mix. Pick and mix still lives on as it happens. What a way to end the video! I'm just gonna wing it. I'm just gonna, just gonna go for it. My boy Cam on the camera. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, personally, raspberries. I do feel that. I don't know why they give you tongs for something this small, but that's. Well, I think you've got scoop there. Ah, you see? It's a good thing you can. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm gonna do that. That feels more in line with how I remember it. I'm feeling smarties. I don't know what the hell these are, so I'm gonna get at least three. Uh, party mix, classic stuff. Jelly beans. Let's do it. Uh, I appreciate that you don't feel weird filming me right now. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I'm not good at this, right? I'm wearing gloves, it's fine. I actually do feel like a kid in a candy store. Like, there's something really fulfilling about this. A couple of blocks of fudge. Get a little close up on the cup. By all means. You can only Ooh. see the fudge, but. You know I'll... it's in there. You yeah, know it's exactly. In there. there it is. That's too big a lid. Let's get the logo on the front. There you go. Over it, maybe. But there it is. Thank you.